WP. Thank you all for attending this next session uh, for the AWE XR enablement track. Uh, I'm really excited about this next simulation, uh, sorry, this next presentation. Um, we have today with us Scott LaForge and Greg Myers, who are the Chief Product, product Officer and the CEO and co-founder of Forge FX Simulations. And their product, Hollow Trainer, is what they are going to be showing us today. So without further ado, uh, Scott LaForge and Greg Myers. All right, let's get started. So uh, my name is Greg Myers. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of ForgeFX Simulations. And on stage with me is Scott LaForge. He is our chief product officer. And he was the program manager for this application that we're here to discuss. And so the title of our talk is Designing, Developing, Deploying, and Supporting Augmented Reality Seaburn Device Training Simulators. And the application that we are, I imagine this is the clicker. Where's the clicker? Clicker? <laughs> is this it? Hit that green button. Hit that green button, see if it works. There we go. There it is. We got it. All right. We need a simulator for this guy. Um, so yeah, so we're here to discuss the Hollow Trainer. But before I get started, I want you to imagine that you are a warfighter or a first responder who is responsible for going into an area that has a hazardous situation that's been reported. And your job is to detect and identify and locate what this material is. And ideally, you've been trained on all of the different devices that the Department of Defense uses in order to detect these different hazardous situations. But perhaps it's been a while since you've detected it. Perhaps you haven't been fully trained on the application. And you need that training because you are in a transport vehicle with two hours until you're dropped into the area. So as we move forward, think of those as the end users for this application. And that was the challenge that we were presented with when we built this application. So the title gives it away. We built an augmented reality training simulator. Uh, it's part of the Enhanced Warfighter Augmented Training Simulation Program of the Department of Defense. And essentially what we did was we took all of the different devices that they use and we built it into one application that runs on the Microsoft HoloLens 2. So a user is going into an area, they're not sure which device they're gonna need, but they have this whole litany, this whole collection of devices with them that they're able to call on. So if I had to bring all those devices with me, it might take a whole shipping container. But with the application that we built, we're able to put it all on one small device. And so we developed virtual training that delivers real world proficiency. So the agenda today is I'm going to continue with the introduction. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of a summary of the application that we built. Then I'm going to hand it over to Scott, who's going to talk about how we worked with the Department of Defense. And he's going to dig into our iterative testing and improvement plan. And then he's going to hand it back to me, where we'll discuss where we're going with the program, and then take some questions and answers. So the key points. Um, this was a joint program that was developed between the Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear Defense, and uh, MRI Global, which is a research facility, and Forge Effect Simulations. And this presentation is going to cover the entire project lifecycle, uh, including the uh, government requirements and the development of holographically projected virtual equipment um, that uh, ultimately allows first responders and soldiers to train for the equipment that they need to know how to use. And the Hollow Trainer is a groundbreaking application. It really allows us to do things within simulation that we could not do in the real world. So as I mentioned, it was a joint partnership between these three teams, uh, the first one being the JPO CBRND. Uh, this is the Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense, which is a mouthful. Um, and they're a component of the Department of Defense that manages the nation's uh, investment in seaburn device uh, defense equipment. So they develop solutions to defend against seaburn threats. Uh, they collaborate with industry, with academia, and with other government organizations in order to develop these capabilities. And ultimately, they're responsible for safeguarding the national security and enabling the US military to operate in these very hazardous environments. Second up was MRI Global. They are a research facility that is dedicated to improving health, safety, and the overall well-being globally uh, through their various efforts. 
And in addition to operating their own research facilities, they operate research facilities for the Department of Defense as well as the Department of Energy. And then last but not least is our company. Um, we are a California Bay Area company. Uh, we've been around for 20 years developing training simulators and we specialize in developing custom 3D training simulators. So we leverage AR, VR, and AI uh, to develop really immersive experiences that allow operators and trainees to get fully immersed and trained in the equipment that they need to know how to use. And we specialize in developing custom simulations as opposed to developing consumer off-the-shelf applications so that we can meet the diverse needs uh, of our clients across our array of different industry sectors. And we've been around for 20 years, so we also spend a lot of time supporting a lot of the applications that we've built, many of which have been out in the field for more than a decade. So the challenge was to provide an impactful, on-demand training to Seaburn operators, regardless of their access to real-world equipment um, or the hazardous materials that they need to learn how to detect. So the solution had to be portable, it had to be lightweight, easy to use, it had to accurately represent a range of different Seaburn devices, um, as well as the hazardous samples. It had to effectively engage a very tech-savvy audience that learns through this learn-by-doing approach as opposed to death by PowerPoint or videos or traditional training materials. It, it had to be hands-on and very involved with the user. And it had to allow for trainers and trainees to work together collaboratively regardless of their individual physical locations. And we'll get into that more. So the Holotrainer is a networked multi-user application uh, it utilizes intuitive hand gestures, so your hands are free, you're not holding a mouse or a keyboard, you're able to interact with things just as you would in the real world, and it supports users with or without the physical device, uh, unlike this remote. Um, it also includes fully functional digital replications of the Seaburn detection devices, and it features the uh, virtual hazardous materials. Um, this is something that is something that you can't really do in the real world. I can't, like an Easter egg hunt, go and hide radioactive material all around this room and ask you to try to find it. It just isn't a safe way to do things. But in simulation, we can do that. And finally, we hard-coded subject matter expert knowledge directly into the application. So as the workforce ages and people leave different industries, a lot of that knowledge walks out the door. And so what we do is we hard code that knowledge directly into our software so that that knowledge stays uh, with the organizations and can be passed on to the trainees. So it's a little bit difficult to demonstrate an AR application to you on a traditional flat screen. Um, but what you're seeing here is a video of two different users who are on opposite ends of the continent interacting and working together as if they were right in the same room with each other. So you're seeing this is the Teledyne FLIR uh, R440, which is a wireless radio radioactivity detector. And what you're seeing is two different people working. They're able to get the full curriculum of training uh, from the application. They're able to talk to each other over voice over IP. They can see each other's avatars. They can hand each other the devices, really as if Scott and I were here demonstrating how to use this device. They're able to do that, even though they're on opposite ends of the country. And so again, a little bit difficult to show an AR application here on a flat screen, but we've got the application at our booth, 736. Come on by and try it out. We'd love to get your feedback. So in addition to the network multi-user aspect, which allows trainers and trainees to work together, we've also hard-coded all of these individual single-player lessons into the application. So if you don't have an internet connection and you've got two hours before you're going to your location, you can walk through all of these pre-built tutorials that tell you exactly how the device works. And it ranges everything from interactive tutorials to how to use the HoloLens and this new construct of interacting with it to parts familiarization to the different devices to all the different tasks that you're gonna have to do. So it's really a self-contained application that allows you to train with this virtual holographically projected version of the device even if you don't have one available. And if you do have a device available, we support that as well. So if I've got the device in my hand, the application delivers the same heads-up display system where I'm seeing all of the training material, I'm seeing a holographically projected version of that same device that I'm working with, and it's going through all of the steps that I'll need to learn. So I can read what's going on in the instructions, I can hear what's happening, as well as I can see this reference animation showing me what I need to do. So a little bit about the design process. Um, 
What we like to say is that we listen and we build, and then we listen and we build, and over and over again. So we always start from the end user requirements and build our training goals out from that. The requirements are probably the most important document that we get, but it's not really the end of the line. Uh, and Scott will go through that a little bit more. Um, and so really what we like to do is we like to collaborate and coordinate with the subject matter experts. So I showed you this image before where there are, I think, 14 different devices currently that we're supporting in the application. And we worked with every single manufacturer and got their trainers and subject matter experts involved in the project to be able to get all of their knowledge and hard code that directly into our device so that by the time a user puts that on, they're not just you know, getting random information, they're getting information from the subject matter experts of that particular device. And this ensures that the training scenarios and the virtual equipment accurately reflect real world situations and equipment. And then we leverage the agile development methodology, which allows us to course correct over the course of the project, as opposed to just building what was in the design document and leaving it at that. And again, Scott will go into that in more detail. So the benefits of the application are that it delivers a safe, controlled environment to work with virtual representations of dangerous material, which, as I just mentioned, is something that's very difficult to do in the real world. And the interactive training with realistic virtual equipment enhances an operator's situational awareness, situational awareness, and it gives them a much better understanding and proficiency with the devices and the tasks that they're going to have to commit. And we also like to mimic real world incidents. So we try to work with our subject matter experts to learn some of the hazards, some of the uh, you know, fail states that they've run into, and we try to replicate that in our application so that the training is super impactful. And then finally, the network connectivity with trainers allows for training anywhere, anytime. And many different features in the application. Uh, probably some of the highlights that are, people are most interested in are the holographically projective interaction, interactive virtual seaburn detection equipment. Um, we've got equipment interaction with the simulated hazardous substances that I mentioned. Um, it's an extensible architecture that allows for us to keep pace with the government. So as they add more devices to their library of devices that their uh, first responders and warfighters need to use, we're able to quickly add those devices into our application as well. And so the holographically projected virtual equipment is probably the most important part of the application, right? So if I don't have the device with me, I'm kind of stuck, but through our application, you have a fully functioning digital replica of that, of that device that you can use, you can interact with, so that by the time you're done with the training, once you put your hands on a real device, you're kind of familiar with it. You've, you've seen it, you've used it, albeit you've never actually held it in your hands. Um, we also uh, provide real-time feedback. So as a user is working through the simulation, we're giving them real-time feedback, we're giving them a performance analysis report at the end so they know how well they've done, they know the different areas they need to focus on in order to master the device. Um, and it really allows users to become familiar with the device, even if the physical device is just not present, which is something that's been very difficult in this industry to do. And so this really revolutionizes the way uh, the government's able to do seaburn training. And I've mentioned it already, but second only to the holographically projected equipment is the fact that this is a multi-user application. It allows for groups of people to train, even if they are in California, Brazil, Boston, all around the world. We can all get together in the same virtual environment and train with this device as if you know, Scott and I were right next to each other, even though we're separated by thousands of miles. And you know, traditionally, if I had to train someone in New York, California, and Hawaii, it might take me a week to travel through all those different locations, meet with all those different people. But through our device, you can do all that in an hour, which is really groundbreaking and ultimately reduces training time and training costs, which is something that all of our clients, regardless of their industry sector, are interested in obtaining. So that's uh, it for me for now. I'm going to hand it over to Scott, who's going to talk about working with the Department of Defense. It's the green button there. Awesome. All right, thanks, Greg. Sure. Uh, yeah, working with the Department of Defense. First of all, it's an honor and a privilege to get the opportunity to do that, to have the opportunity to have our developers creating solutions that are directly impacting the safety and the effectiveness of our military. Uh, being a customer-centric company and being able to work with these subject matter experts who are making these detection devices, working directly with special forces, soldiers, and different groups, it's been a pretty powerful experience. 
So given a little bit of backstory of the DOD and specifically those working uh, for the, with these detection systems, we got the JPO CBRND and the CBDP. The hollow trainer we worked with the JPO CBRND, uh, but I'll focus high level and then we'll go a little more detail with them. So the JPO CBRND, their mission is to provide an integrated CBRN defense capabilities to the joint force across all domains of operations. Their vision is basically a resilient joint force that's enabled the warfighter to handle any kind of seaburn threat. And they are championed you know, by innovative, agile, results-oriented acquisitions professionals. That's a mouthful. Um, the CBDP, the Chemical Biological Defense Program, their goal is to anticipate future threat threats and deliver capabilities uh, that enable the joint force to neutralize adversarial chemical biological threats. Oh, and um, going back to that one second. Yeah, and so, you know, there's real things going on. We have COVID, we have nerve agents, we have sarin attacks, you know. So both of these organizations within the DOD are about preparedness. And so our work is to align our expertise towards solving their problems and for the, the things that they provide, we're providing solutions that allow training for those elements. So the JPO, CBRND, they have three strategic goals to achieve seaburn defense integration, interoperability, and interdependence across all warfighting domains and functions, to foster an environment that seeks innovative enterprise solutions across industry, academia, and warfighters that is agile, versatile, and efficient, and to provide indispensable value to the warfighter, the DOD, Congress, the nation, and our allies and partners. So the JPO CBRD focus areas are on you know, modernizing biological defense to integrated early warning to unencumbering the warfighter. They're investing you know, money into artificial intelligence, wearable sensors, decontamination procedures and equipment, and all of this stuff is there to make the warfighter more effective and safe. And so our goal is to align that anything that they're spending this money onto and then want training towards to making our, our uh, soldiers more effective, we're there to help make sure that those things that, uh, that they're well trained on that and that they're safe and effective. And so the JPO has a comprehensive approach that covers maritime, land, air, cyber, and space. And that's through three integrated layers of defense, which is to understand the problem, to protect against it, and to mitigate those things. And they're using sensors, as I mentioned, medical equipment and procedures, and different types of protection equipment and procedures. And so again, we work with those subject matter experts that anything that they're investing in to do those layers of defense, we're helping build training tools that are effective for those soldiers to do what they do best and be safe. What are the benefits of working with the DOD? Well, for one thing, they have really unique and complex challenges. And so we get the opportunity to work on those things and solve those problems with them uh, by using our expertise in the technology frame to address those. And we're literally having a part in protecting the nation and its interests. And that's a new and unusual thing for us to be a part of. So that's pretty special. And by working with the DOD, our developers get to create the solutions that actually have a real impact. And again, I say you know, safety and effectiveness. Not only that, you know, beyond financial reward, again, we're getting the satisfaction of serving our country and there's some professional growth that we have. So one of the biggest things is with the constant changing threats in the world and the constant advances of technology, um, you have to be agile in this field or anything that you develop is gonna be out of scope, no longer effective for the actual need that's happening now. So traditional approaches to solving those problems aren't necessarily effective to those types of threats or those types of changes. So agile solutions, they're able to quickly adapt to those types of things um, and that's essential for what the DOD does. And at ForgeFX, we're a company that uses an agile methodology. So we're used to constantly iterating rapidly and then changing course depending on the need. So all of this together, what the DOD is doing, what we've been having the opportunity to do is to help our warfighters, to empower them, 
to improve their safety and their effectiveness. And you know, these solutions range from training and simulation tools to advanced technologies that enhance battlefield awareness and communication. One of the interesting things too is that their need, you know, the JPO is demand driven. So they're not just creating ideas, um, you know, creating solutions and then looking for problems that they solve. They're actually meeting warfighters' needs that they have today, right now, and they're seeking solutions to improve those things. And they're addressing real world problems that they're facing. So key takeaways of working with the DOD, well, for one thing, you know, it's meaningful. Uh, we get to work with these people to have a real impact on our national security. Uh, we're creating agile solutions that are solving real world problems and making our warfighters safer. So how does the hollow trainer, you know, remain effective? And that's really through, you know, our iterative testing, feedback integration, and validation. And that's what makes the hollow trainer continue to thrive and advance and be, remain an effective tool. Uh, we meticulously evaluate the performance of the hollow trainer by assessing its accuracy and realism, testing its ease of use, its scalability, and the technical consistency to provide a seamless training experience. Sort of the cornerstone of all this is user feedback. So the, our feedback collection analysis and prioritization of that feedback is how we keep advancing it and how we keep improving on what their product is and how we build the roadmap to the future of what it could become. And really the cornerstone of that is actually meeting both with the subject matter experts to make sure that we're giving an accurate and clear proper training of the device and that's really important and then bringing it right to the hands of the users themselves, our soldiers, our special forces groups where they get to hands on, act, test it out, give us feedback, we take it back to our development team and then we iterate on that and then we improve it and then we go back again and they get to see it again. So they're really the cornerstone of how we collect information and then make a better product. And so all of this type of iterative improvement that we're doing, you know, is basically we build a giant wish list of things. Our goal, we have a statement of work, we have a budget, and we have to make something functional. But at the end of the day, it also has to be effective and meaningful for them that they want to actually train with it. So there's a combination of things. And so a lot of times you have to juggle with that user feedback, what's important, what's not. And so you collect a giant list of wish list items from little tiny things to very complicated things. And between those things, you either build a roadmap towards where they could take it because of their need, or you have these little things. And so the last thing before I turn it back to you, Greg, is that uh, in the image here you can see you know, one really simple example is that in this multi-user experience they're learning how to power on a device and there's three users in the room and they are all the same color. And so as one person's doing this or that, it's hard and confusing to determine who's actually doing the work. And so one person's feedback was, hey, could we color code this and have unique colors per person? And such a simple thing is very effective in just making the tool a little bit more powerful that, for that user experience. And so last thing that I'm gonna mention, this relationship that we built with the DOD, with MRI Global uh, and ForgeFX, our soldiers, uh, all these wish list items went into you know, a pocket and we've been rating them from little tiny things that would improve the experience to the user. And so I'll just show this. Internally within our own company, we developed this thing called Operation Panda Fox. And so it's taking that statement of work and yep, we met the statement of work, it's functional. But we reached a point that we're like a little ahead of schedule and our own developers took it on themselves to tackle all those little wish list items and start ex you know, working on the user ex experience to make it magical, make it something more that they would want to use frequently and often. And then in the opposite direction, developing tools under the hood that allows us to iterate quicker in the future for building that product and again experience, you know, enhancing that user experience. And this was so uh, moving to the DOD uh, and JPM Seaburn Soft that they actually responded to that with Operation Pan or, uh, with, uh, with Spirited Fox. And I don't know if anybody is military or anything like that, but they basically um, designed a morale patch for our team. Yep, which is right here that I brought here today and that we're proud to wear on different backpacks and stuff. And it was a, a, 
showing the camaraderie and the partnership that we have with all of those that we're all working together towards that effectiveness, making our, our team safe and as they're protecting our interests. And with that, um, so last thing is that, you know, those are the little tiny details. And then, like I was saying, there's big things uh, that you can't tackle with just a little bit of time. And that's how we build a roadmap for where this could go next for them. And so taking this simple, you know, basic detection systems that's training our operators how to use this equipment and detect threats, and then to the roadmap that Greg will talk about next. Sure. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Ooh. Good stuff. Yeah, so we've only got a little bit of time left. And, you know, one thing I just want to reiterate what Scott said is that I've been developing software for about 25 years now, and I have never worked on a project that is more rewarding than this project has been. You know, you can develop pretty much anything if you're a software developer, but being able to work on a project that directly affects your, na your national security for your country is just a really rewarding experience. And it's something the Department of Defense needs. They're looking for developers to come to them with innovative ideas to develop stuff rapidly. So <clears throat> if this is something that you're interested in, you should really pursue this because there is a need from the government for uh, developers, especially in this area. So um, looking forward for this project, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we're really excited to be here at this show because we are always looking at some of the new tools, some of the new technologies that are available. And so we're really excited to see what the different vendors are going to be offering uh, as we continue to advance this project. And so looking at the roadmap that Scott discussed, uh, we're in a four-year program right now. We're probably somewhere squarely between B and C at the moment, where we've developed step-by-step -step procedural lessons. We're developing some unlocked freedom, uh, free-form modalities. And we're now moving into developing scenarios that are specific to the different situations the warfighters and first responders will face. In addition, we're going to be building uh, a training simulator scenario builder that will allow the trainers themselves to build custom lessons that are specific to the different situations that their uh, staff will face. So it really opens up the application to be anything that the trainers need it to be. And ultimately, our plan is to move to more immersive missions where we'll take advantage of some of the XR headsets and AR, VR hybrid headsets that allow us to go from AR training to more immersive VR training within the same headset, within the same experience. And so diving into that just a little bit, what you're seeing here in this graphic is someone who's using the holo trainer on the left, and they're able to train, perhaps with other people, using that device, learning how to use that device in isolation. <clears throat> and then they're able to quickly switch, and let me zoom in on this one, they're able to quickly switch to a more immersive environment. So first they learn how to use the device in AR, where they're just focusing on the device, the different procedures it can do, the different tasks. And then with the flip of a switch, suddenly they're in a VR environment where they still have that device, but now they're in, let's say, a clandestine laboratory where they need to determine is the user making bombs? Is they, are they making drugs here? And they're able to take the knowledge that they've just used with training on this device and now apply it to a real environment. Again, something that's very difficult to do in the real world, but something that we can do easily in simulation. So in conclusion, the application that we've built is groundbreaking. It is revolutionary change the way people are able to change for Seaburn device detection operation. Um, it provides risk-free exposure to virtu virtual dangerous substances. I know I've said that many times, but that was one of the premier goals of this application, and we feel like we've met that goal. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we're reducing the cost of training equipment, materials, training hours, and travel, which again is something that every industry is looking to do. So that's our time. Thank you very much for coming to our session. Uh, again, we're at booth 736. Uh, if you'd like to come try the application out, feel free to contact us. We'd love to get user feedback. Even if you're not a first responder or warfighter, we'd love to get your feedback and try and incorporate it into the application. And with that, we'd love to take some questions. Actually, I, I think we don't have any more time for questions. I'm so sorry, guys. We are not interested in your questions. <laughs> <laughs> so come to our booth. Come to our booth, 736. 736. We'll talk all day. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Yep.